of the Gospel. Today's reading comes from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 10, verses 1 through 9. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if a person of peace is there, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide. But the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you, cure the sick who are there, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Here ends the reading for today. May this scripture inspire us all to walk in the way that leads to life. We 
Kristen, as she brings your word to us. Be with her as she goes out to our community, feeding our souls with everlasting love from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. I, um, I'm more comfortable behind here because I use my hands. I can't, like with Gwen last week, I admire her, she can stand up there with the mic, but I, I am very animated, so this is where my place is. Um, <laughs> but this morning I'm gonna start with a story that some of you might be familiar with. It's about a mouse, a chicken, a pig, and a cow that live on a farm. A mouse is out exploring and looks through the crack in a wall to see a farmer and his wife opening a package. What food might it contain? The mouse begins to think about all the different novelties he could be enjoying. Maybe cookie crumbs, or a piece of pie crust, or best of all, a piece of cheese. He was devastated to discover it was a mouse trap. <laughs> Retreating to the farmyard, the mouse proclaimed the warning, there's a mouse trap in the house, there's a mouse trap in the house. The chicken clucked and scratched, raised her head and said, Mr. Mouse, I can tell this is of grave concern to you but it is of no consequence to me. I cannot be bothered by it. The mouse then turns to the pig and told him, there's a mouse trap in the house, there's a mouse trap in the house. The pig sympathized and said, I'm very sorry, Mr. Mouse, but there is nothing I can do but pray. Be assured you are in my prayers. The mouse turned to the cow and said, there's a mouse trap in the house, there's a mouse trap in the house. And the cow said, wow, Mr. Mouse, I'm sorry for you, but it's no skin off my nose. So the mouse returned to the house, head down and dejected, to face the farmer's mouse trap alone. That very night, there was a sound heard throughout the house like the sound of a mouse trap catching its prey. The farmer's wife rushed out to see what was caught. In the darkness, she did not see it was a venomous snake that had gotten its tail caught in the trap. The snake bit the farmer's wife. The farmer rushed her to the hospital and she returned home with a fever. Everyone knows you treat a fever with fresh chicken soup. So the farmer took out his hatchet to the farmyard to fetch the soup's main ingredient. But the wife's sickness continued, so friends and neighbors came to sit with her around the clock. To feed them, the farmer butchered the pig. The farmer's wife still did not progress well and she eventually died. So many people came for the funeral and the farmer had the cow slaughtered to provide enough meat for them all. The mouse looked up upon it from it, sorry, the mouse looked upon it all from his crack in the wall with great sadness. So, the next time you hear someone that is facing a problem or see someone troubled and think that it doesn't concern you, remember the mouse in the house. 
Friends, we are all connected. We all have parents, some have siblings, others may have spouses or children of their own. Then we might belong to a neighborhood, a sports team, a book club. Going further, we belong to an ethnic or cultural group, a church congregation. Beyond that, we're citizens of a county, a city, a state, and a nation. And above all, we are children of God and united in the body of Christ. Paul reminds us in the book of Romans and in 1 Corinthians where many members are baptized into one body with different functions. Your pain is my pain, and your success is my success. This can be, bring great solidarity and develop into deep relationships with one another. Yet, on the other hand, we are also viewed and judged collectively by others as the body of Christ. People observe our actions and our behaviors. A recent poll of over 3,000 adults commissioned by the Episcopal Church in late 2021 reported the following results. 26% of those polled said Christians are hypocritical and judgmental. 23% think they are self-righteous. And 13% said they were arrogant. On the plus side, 47% said Christians were giving and 44 said they were loving. Now, I would argue there is still significant room for improvement here. Reverend David F. Watson, who is a professor of New Testament and academic dean at United Theological Seminary, responded to these results and asserted, I think what the poll demonstrates is that what we have not done a sufficient job of teaching who people, is, sorry, let me repeat the quote. I think what the poll demonstrates is that we have not done a sufficient job of teaching people who Jesus is and why he's important. Instead, our culture has become more polarized and self-centered. This is fed by the other disturbing statistic that 48% of mainline Protestants consider their relationship with Jesus private. How are we meant to connect with one another and expand the kingdom of God if we keep our faith private? Althea Spencer Miller, an associate professor of New Testament at Drew University, also responded to the poll and said, I do not want to pronounce judgment on someone who thinks they need to be private about their Jesus. Yet avoiding discussion about faith eventually leads to too narrow a conception of it. She continues, while it may be helpful for a while, after a time, it becomes the least helpful way of finding yourself in the very world that God created. Jesus invites us to explore contacts with other people who don't think like ourselves. The concept of solely private relationship with Jesus also struck Reverend Watson as a non-starter. He says, Christ didn't just call a bunch of individuals and say, have a personal relationship with me in your heart. He called together a community, and that community we call is church. America's ethos of the rugged individual also contradicts the concept of a community where people are accountable and supportive of one another. I would add that when you also acknowledge the cultural value of busyness, our ability to see opportunities to witness and engage with one another is limited. We are so busy doing instead of being. Reverend Watson asserts, I think we live according to a myth that we can do things on our own. I don't think anybody accomplishes anything of value without the guidance and assistance of the Holy Spirit. We need one another. And we need God to provide us direction and to provide us the gifts we need to carry out what is truly good in the world. 
So the scripture today reminds us of the importance of the Holy Spirit in our connection to one another to fulfill God's mission, which is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. It is through this obedience that we find peace in ourselves and in the world. The passage from Luke this morning takes place during Jesus' journey to Jerusalem, where his destiny lies. The terrain surrounding Jerusalem is rugged and unforgiving. There's rocky hills and little water to the west and forbidding desert to the east and scorching temperatures throughout the year. Travel could be dangerous, so hospitality to the traveler was an ongoing need and a sacred duty. During his travels, Jesus cultivates the faith of the 12 disciples, teaches the crowds, and spars with spiritual leaders and teachers who oppose his religious vision and its embodiment in practice. At the start of chapter 10, Jesus' ministry takes a sense of urgency, and he sends out 72 disciples. This was a second mission on which Jesus sent a group of his disciples. The first being the mission of the 12, which is recorded earlier in Luke chapter 9. Only Luke records the supplemental vision, though there are similarities of reference in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark. It is not surprising, though, to find this narrative in Luke. Luke had an interest in showing the development of God's mission from a small beginning growing to a worldwide establishment in the book of Acts. While Jesus is the chief actor, the purpose that drives the story is God's. Divine empowerment through the Holy Spirit authorizes Jesus and his apostles, their message, active healing, and inclusive hospitality embody God's rule. Luke's emphasis in today's scripture is the configuration and directives Jesus gave disciples in preparation for their ministry and the expansion of God's kingdom. The 72 disciples are sent out in pairs, knowing that according to the Mosaic law that two witnesses are needed for credible testimony. Together with the original 12, the 72 disciples are to announce the approach of God's reign and heal the sick, relying on the hospitality of those they encounter. In addition, they are given detailed instructions about the attitude that they should have when they enter each home and receive hospitality. They went empty-handed, but were empowered by Jesus with the following gifts. First, speak peace into the home. Peace, or shalom, means more than restfulness or freedom from stress. It also means protection, healing, and financial security. Second, eat what is set before them. These were Jews going out, and it was believed what Jesus was referring to was that what might be offered to them may not be kosher, but that it was okay to eat what was presented before them. Third, heal those who were sick. They would have the ability to bring healing through the power of God to those in the household. And finally, to say the kingdom of God has come near to you. There are three clear instructions about the disciples' conduct and mission. So to eat what is provided, heal the sick, and announce the kingdom. The three facets of the mission encompass the creation of community, caring of physical needs, and the proclamation of the gospel of the kingdom. The disciples, therefore, were charged to continue the three facets of Jesus' work in Galilee. But why greet each home with a declaration of peace? As noted earlier in the passage, it was anticipated that not everyone would receive the gospel message well. In verse 3, it says, Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. 
Living in a culture that I feel is significantly divided and polarized, the risk of offending someone is greater than ever. Perhaps this is one of your fears that Pastor Vicki identified a few weeks ago about being concerned about being misunderstood or what other people think of you. I know this hits home for me. I have extreme anxiety when I know I have to have a controversial conversation, whether at work or at home. For those of you that might, may not know, I work at the U.S. Department of Justice in the Office for Victims of Crime, and I uh, support programs that uh, serve victims of human trafficking through different grant awards. And so with that comes a lot of responsibility and accountability. So in the last few weeks, I've had several uncomfortable conversations. One was with a program who was not compliant with their award conditions, and I was needing to hold them accountable. And I hate being the bad guy, because I want to be liked by everybody. Another phone call was with a program who may have to make the difficult decision to decline their grant because of unforeseen obstacles and delays outside their control, leaving victims of human trafficking unserved. I also anticipate that I will encounter defensiveness or resistance as I advocate for survivors of domestic and sexual violence and human trafficking through my ministry. Not only will abusers feel threatened, but others may react hostily because I will be challenging institutional and cultural beliefs that exist in our economic, justice, and social systems. But if I ground myself in the larger mission, whether ensuring government funds are spent correctly and meeting their individual goals, or initiating systemic change to reduce additional trauma for survivors, I find my purpose and courage. Moreover, if I ground myself in Christ's love and share the blessings of hospitality and healing, God's kingdom will manifest. The motive of peace and goodwill is the premise of all of these other actions. Just like the disciples, we are to proclaim and share good news through word or action to everyone. We are not to be selective, choosing only to speak to those of may not be who do not intimidate us. We are to be hospitable to all we encounter, healing anyone in need. The need for peace and healing is there, and there is real urgency. Do not be deaf to Christ's call, but answer with generosity to the best of your ability. Offer blessings confidently without concern for how your good wishes will be received. We never know what a person may need. So many things are unspoken and invisible. Perhaps the person sitting next to you this morning cannot pay their bills this week. Or the clerk at the grocery store that you encounter has recently gone through a divorce. Or your child is battling with depression or anxiety. We must trust the nudges we receive from God and enter our encounters peacefully, seeking trust and understanding. As with the 72 disciples, we are sent ahead to plant the seed and leave the final results up to God. We will not be lessened by what is not received because we know what we offer comes from God. Instead, we will be praised for our obedience and find peace and right relationship with God. For as proclaimed in Micah verse, sorry, chapter 7, verse 8, it says, he has told you, O oh mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. We have a responsibility to advocate for the disenfranchised, abused, and forgotten. We have the same spirit that Jesus Christ has, so our ability to teach, heal, and inspire means that no one and nothing is outside the realm of possibility. 
We each have a power in a unique way, whether it's through who we are, for myself, a white, middle, upper class, educated, and financially secure woman, or our connections through community, or our jobs, or our family, or our individual lived experience, whether it might be addiction, trauma, or grief. When we share hospitality and offer ourselves to others, we share God's peace and healing. We live into our purpose to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. In addition, by being hospitable and using our gifts, we find love and peace through our interaction and connection with others. How often have you heard that it is better to give than to receive? How often have you felt the unbridled gift of giving? There is an unanticipated euphoric feeling when we give authentically to others and not anticipating anything in return. Whether it's our time, our money, or our compassion, we are filled, not drained, by our engagement. This is because we are in alignment with God's mission. In his sermon entitled, On Living Without God, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, proclaims, Indeed, nothing can be more sure than that true Christianity cannot exist without both the inward experience and outward practice of justice, mercy, and truth. There is no inner transformation that is not expressed in outward action. Wesley built the Methodist Church upon the simple foundation that Christians are, by the very nature of their faith, drawn into community through the personal and transformation experience of the love of God. He believed that God's love was powerful enough to transform individual lives and the life of the world, that Christian life is profoundly personal and essentially social. As described in the book entitled Recapturing the Wesley's Vision, Paul Wesley Chicolti reminds us that our personal encounter with God is just the starting point of our faith. It marks the beginning of a loving relationship that draws us into a whole new set of relationships within the family of God, as affirmed in our sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. However, self-love, the consequence of knowing that God loves and values us, must be connected necessarily to social love, loving our neighbor as we love ourselves, for life to be truly whole. Community is therefore necessary, and it is only in the context of a community that God's love will grow in us and we will find peace. The great danger in Wesley's age, and what I would argue even today, was the tendency for many of us to privatize our religious experiences, as evidenced in the survey conducted by the Episcopal Church. Chicolti asserts that Christianity is essentially a social religion, and to turn it into a solitary religion is to destroy it. Moreover, it goes against God's purpose. In another sermon entitled Works, John Wesley states that to conceal this religion of love is impossible and contrary to God's design. We must stay connected to one another to experience the love and peace of God. I experienced this profoundly myself during my time in seminary. I was learning academically about God and the doctrine of the United Methodist Church, but I felt very disconnected and alone. My personal relationship with God and with others was disintegrating. I was working full-time, attending classes, writing papers, and wearing all the hats of wife, sister, stepmother, friend, daughter, church parishioner, among others. I allowed my time and my priorities to be dictated by the demands of the world rather than valuing and nurturing the relationships that sustained me. 
The stress ultimately led me to a full-blown anxiety attack at one of the most important moments in my life. I was devastated and fearful for the future I thought God wanted for me. Yet it was with the grace of others that carried me through. My selfless husband, who cooked meals every night and found other activities to engage in while I studied. A dear friend I met in seminary who could identify with the academic demands and console me when I was feeling anxious. Prayers and notes of encouragement from friends. Clergy who saw my potential and passion for ministry. It was through these connections and community, however distant I may have felt, that I am here today. I found hospitality and healing through the words and actions of others. Do not question the impact you may have on someone's life or the significance of it. It may be exactly what the person needs. As Gwen reminded us last week in her message, using and walking by faith is more important than the amount of faith. Planting the seed of God's love and grace through acts of hospitality and healing provides an invitation to be in relationship with Christ and one another. This is the best gift we can share. After all, this is what Christ did for us. So even if you're struggling or angry at God right now, look for opportunities to connect and serve others. This is where you will find your joy and peace. I know I have. Praise be to God. Amen. come to the time in our service where we give thanks for all of you for everything that you do and all of your gifts. Today what we want to highlight in our offering message is one of two of the ministries that um, go unnoticed a lot of times but many of you have probably been the recipients of it. We have a card making ministry where they lovingly hand make cards. And these cards then can be picked up outside for your use for anything. 
They're the most beautiful things I've ever seen and made with a lot of love. That's a card ministry making. We also have a card sending ministry, and many of you have been probably recipients of that for weddings or anniversaries or birthdays or sympathy even. And those, that's another group that actually takes the time to find from our prayer list or our joys and concerns and send out cards to people. Both of those ministries are active. Both of them are always looking for people to volunteer. And if you have any interest in it, see either Mickey or Dee Speck to help out. But one of the joys of the ministry of this church. And those ministries couldn't happen without all of you and all of your financial gifts and all of your physical support in volunteering. As you know, there's many ways to give. We've got the boxes in the back. Um, people have envelopes. You can give online. You can text any way possible that you can both give your financial support, but also your, your support in volunteering and just your support for this church and being here. So thank you for your, your gifts, for your presence, and I thank you for your music.
our prayer today has a response. It won't be on the screen, but your response is one that we all know. And the response is, hear our prayer, which you would say after I say, God of love. Gracious God, may your spirit give strength to all your people as they work and witness in your world. Bless the faith communities at Bethel, Faith in Israel. Unite us in your truth and love and help us to show your love to others. God of love, hear our prayer. Father God, we pray for our pastors and minister of music as they travel and enjoy the beauty and wonders of Alaska. Bless them with a restful time and bring them back safely to us. God of love, hear our prayer. God, our creator, help everyone to share all the good gifts that you've given to us. We pray for our community and for all those who live and work in this area. God of love, hear our prayer. God, our friend, we pray for our families and friends. May we be able to help each other just as you love and help us. We pray for those in need, for sick people, for those in hospital care, and those in need of healing. God of love, hear our prayer. We pray for ourselves, all that we will do this week and all those that we will meet. Loving God, we give, you, we give this week to you. Be with us in all that we will do. May we enjoy this week and truly be, in the, ha be the hands and feet of Jesus. God of love, hear our prayer. Those things, O oh God, that your servants have prayer for, and in the purpose of your love, answer our prayers and fulfill our hopes. For Jesus' sake, amen. Now, now join us as we say the prayer that Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
So go now in the assurance of God's presence and love. Be light unto the world, sharing God's love and peace with all that those you encounter, never knowing what seed you could be planting. Go now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.